Hello, my name is Victor Aberdeen from ISO, and I'm here at the Photography Academy to talk to you about calibrated monitors. We've got here a, an ISO self-calibrating monitor with a Spider 4 here, so we're going to explain to you how those devices work and what effect they have on the screens. You can uh, see here from the picture, I hope, what lovely tones we've got on stand there. He's a mature student at Wolverhampton University. So the monitors here uh, are hardware calibrated. And that's different from most of the monitors you'll see in the market that you buy. So maybe you're using one from Hewlett Packard or Dell or Apple even. Uh, and all those monitors, uh, they display the picture coming out of your video card and present the picture to you on the screen. If you've got one of those monitors, you can calibrate it here with the Spider and using the Spider software. And it will give you a reasonable representation of the monitor, of the picture on the monitor screen. What then's the difference? Why have a hardware monitor if you can calibrate the picture on an ordinary monitor? Well, it's about the way it's doing it and what's happening in the monitor when it's doing it. So when you calibrate using the Spider software on an ordinary screen, what you're effectively doing is telling the computer to adjust the colors that are seen on the monitor. There's nothing in the monitor to make sure those colors stay the same or that the tone comes the same. And we'll come back to tone. Tone's very important. The other thing that's going on in here is there's actually a thermometer in this monitor and a, and a brightness checker. I know nobody can see, but hands up those of you who've had a print that's too dark. I thought so. Why is that? Well, it's very simple. When you get a print that's too dark, it's because the brightness of the monitor is too high. You're effectively, for those old people like me who remember dark rooms and printing on paper, overexposing your brain. Too much light, you need to turn the light down. And that's why when you're calibrating a screen, you have several parameters, one of which, and I'll run through them, and I know you can't quite read them here, but one of which on top of the list there is brightness. Brightness sets the amount of light coming through. On an ordinary monitor, that's quite difficult to achieve because you can calibrate your monitor and then maybe somebody else comes and uses it and presses the buttons. On this monitor, the brightness is set inside the monitor in the hardware there. Nothing to do with what's going on in the computer. We have um, a white point as well. We could have a philosophical discussion about white, but we're not going to. This monitor at the moment is set to 6,500. And let me slide this down so you can see Stan's face behind the spider there. Uh, and I'm just going to change it to 5,000. And you'll all have seen that's gone a bit yellow. Now, there's an interesting fact for you. If you'd walked in and looked at that monitor as it is now, you'd have assumed it was white. It's on what's known as the black body curve. Don't worry about it. It's a white point. This is the white of paper. So if I was to take a book and print Stan in a book, he would look like this, nice and warm. Your eyes are now getting used to that color, and you're thinking that's normal. And if I go back and pop it back into the 6,500, <gasps> he's gone blue. No, we've just shifted the white point, and that's a key factor in managing the color on your monitor. And one that's very difficult for people like data color to achieve on an ordinary monitor. And they do a good job of it. But that's the subtle difference between a hardware calibrated monitor and a monitor calibrated in the video card, where you're asking the video card to try and control something that it hasn't got control of. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, the white point, though, of film was 5,500. Well, let's select that one. And these are in good blue Peter fashion, ones I've prepared earlier. So there you can see now the color of Stan's face at 5,500. I'll go back up to 6,500. Again, we go blue. And then I go back down to 5,000. And now we've gone a bit yellow again. So it's easy to think. Start with thinking about what your output's going to be. And if you're going for projection or on screen, 
Generally, 6,500 is good. If you're going to out to print, then you should have the white point that matches the paper you're using. And if you're printing on an Epson printer, for example, most of those papers actually sit not at 5,000, but at 6,500. So that's the white point. So that's the second parameters. We've had brightness. Now we've had white point. Well, let me just air back to brightness for a moment. When it's too bright, and you're thinking, how do I adjust it correctly? Stick a print where you'd normally view it. View that print with the same image on screen. Ideally, get a reference print from, say, Loxley Color. You can obtain a reference print from Loxley Color, and they'll send you a file. You can look at the file on screen, and you can look at the print next to the, next to the screen here, where you normally look at prints. If the two in your eyes, not, not measured, but in your eyes, are about the same brightness, then your prints are going to come out all right. If the screen is too bright or too dark, then you need to adjust the brightness level, the candela level, so they match. Remember, you can measure this, but it's your eyes that are making the decisions about the brightness. So as good as the light meter you might use might be, your eyes are the important factor. So if you meter it and then say, it just doesn't look quite right, go with your instinct. Yeah? Ah, but you're in a conservatory and you've got your monitor in the corner. You've got a problem because you've got a variable light source around you. So the best thing to do is actually to find a location to put the monitor where you're not affected by extreme changes in light. Uh, and certainly a broadcast studio like this is not the place to do it. Um, so, two factors there. You've got brightness and you've got color temperature, really key factors in calibrating a monitor. And then a couple of other areas that come into the equation, and they're not as critical as those two, but they're important. So another show of hands. How many of you shoot RAW? Thought so. Very good. RAW's the way to go. RAW file is generally Adobe RGB. And what does that mean? Well, think of a box of crayons. And you, with Adobe RGB, you've got a big box of crayons. Say a box of crayons this big. They come in triangles, color spaces. Big box of crayons. But then someone wants a picture and you supply it to them as a JPEG and you've shot it in camera and your camera's set to sRGB. Well, if you've got a different box of crayons, not quite, just slightly smaller. You've lost a bunch of those crayons. So there's a bunch of color not there. But when you do a conversion in Photoshop, say, it matches the colors to keep it perceptually the same. It's very useful for you that that software can do that. There are catches to it. Sometimes it warms the picture up a little more than maybe you want to. But most of the time, it's good. And it'll keep it accurate. So here on this monitor, you've got the Adobe RGB color space right now. And we could switch it down to the sRGB space in the software. We're not going to let you into a little secret. Broadcast video is sRGB. And what you're looking at now is coming to you, actually in a color space called Rec 709, blah, 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 blah. Let's, let's, sRGB is what video is. So while I've got Adobe RGB on the screen here, uh, unfortunately, you wouldn't be able to see the difference because the camera is not capturing it. Difference between JPEG sRGB and RAW and Adobe RGB. Do a little experiment, though. Take your camera out, go and shoot something with a color checker from a Data Color Spider and put the two together. So you've got a reference point there for colors and you've got some real world colors. Go and shoot those items and have a look. <coughs> Do it as JPEG sRGB. Do it as Adobe RGB in RAW and have a look at what the differences are on your screen. And if you know somebody who's got a top grade color management monitor like this ISO here, and have a look at it on that, because then you'll start to see some subtle differences. So, we've not mentioned one key factor here. We've gone through brightness, we've talked about white point, and we've talked about the color space, which is what this little area here is, and I know that's small on screen for you, and the triangle that's on there, which is showing you the limit of the color. There's another factor in here, which often 
gets people a little confused. Curves. I hope you're all using curves in Photoshop or Lightroom. Uh, it's certainly the way to go, and if it doesn't work for you, keep experimenting with it. But here on the screen, we have a thing called a gamma curve. And what that curve does is it allows you to see the tone as our eyes perceive it, not necessarily as the device is designed to work. So let me drag Stan down here a little bit and, and give you a little bit of an example. Excuse me, spider, let me slide you over there. So here I've got a highlight area. And round here I've got some dark shadows and some more dark shadows there. If we were looking on this monitor with a compressed tone curve, which is what you normally get with what I'll call an office screen, you wouldn't see a lot of the detail in there, and you wouldn't necessarily see the detail in the highlight. And in fact, recently I was with a photographer who'd taken a fabulous picture with a Hasselblad camera of a manor house. And there on the front of the manor house was a security alarm, right next to some shadow area. And he was going to reject this, looking on his laptop screen. All he could see was a piece of marshmallow and a black strip where the shadow was. I plugged in a monitor with a proper tone curve, an ISO like this, and he was aghast because he could read the writing on the marshmallow. All of a sudden, it became a burglar alarm. And in the shadows, he could see the detail. So if you imagine your, and think about cameras now, dynamic range is that. And our monitor shows you that. And other monitors show you this. You've lost all that dynamic range. That's what the gamma curve does. And it's not enough just to get it right in the middle. It has to be right all the way through the range, because we want those skin tones to be represented accurately. I hope that's making sense for you. So we have a monitor that's got hardware in it. Um, that will allow it to be calibrated. This particular monitor comes with a calibration device built in. Ah, you're asking, why have you got one here then to do it? Well, because I want you to see how the data color spider works too. But also, if you're working with other people using one of these monitors, this device needs to be matched to a device that you share between the other monitors so that you're all on the same color space. And that's called correlation. You might not need it. You might not be working with other people. But if you are, uh, for example, CGI artists, or if you're working on photos between people, then it's better to have your screens in the same context. So let's go and calibrate this monitor. And I'll talk you through what's actually happening as it does it. And we'll start off with calibrating with this device, it takes a couple of minutes for the Spider 4 to calibrate the screen. I'm sure you've all seen that, where you place the, the monitor when you've been doing your calibrations. I'm not going to ask who isn't. I hope you're all doing it. <coughs> Put the Spider there in the center, and we click Proceed. But here's a question. Does it have to be in the center? No. It could be anywhere on the screen, because the, the screen should be uniform. And wherever you take the measurements, you should get equivalent measurements to anywhere else. And that's part of the functionality of a color-managed monitor, like this ISO. Let me click Proceed. Now we go through. It's blackened the monitor. And, and just a word for the wise as you are, standing under a big light is not the way to do calibration. Ideally, do it in a darkened or subdued room, because this is a big piece of glass. And the light's pouring into here, and this spider is picking up that light, as well as the back light coming off this screen. Uh, and it's not a good thing. Big white box in there. Not great. So here, we have the software now putting up color swatches. And if you run the data color software, you will see lots of different colors bouncing around. They'll different hues, purples and magentas, yet here you're only going to see white, grays through black, red, green and blue. And the reason for that is that we know 
internally how the monitor works and we don't need to go through all those colors because we know what the balance is and that's the difference between a hardware calibrated monitor working with the color and a monitor that is working with uh, the video card controlling how its color is viewed. Now over here and I think you can just about pick that up we've actually got a little uh, diagrammatic view of how the monitor is calibrating. And, and this is useful for you. And if you go on the ISO site and look at the Color Navigator page, you can see some images of that. Uh, it's useful for you to think of color in this way. You have a, a ring, which is the color space. And that's where the colors are defined. Your red, green, and blue, cyan, magenta, and yellow. Then there's a spike running up the middle. And that spike is the luminance. So it's going from black through to full white. And if, if we're to plot this as a mathematical thing, no, I'm not going to bore you with maths, don't worry. I'm no good at it. X, Y, and Z. It's that simple. So the brightness is the Z level. And the monitor goes from as near as zero as it can get to as near full brightness as it can be, and then encompassing all the colors. And this is where the, the, another difference comes in. It is, because this is a hardware calibrated monitor, this device is measuring the brightness as well, and we are adjusting the brightness to be the correct, in this case, 100 candela, which is actually the standard for broadcast television uh, for this monitor. And 100 candela is reasonably bright. You can see now we got the blue patch there. And it doesn't take very long. How often should you do it? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I suppose you could have it happen every Saturday night, but that might be a bit of a bore. You should really be going out then on Saturday nights. Uh, go and enjoy some theater or the cinema or something. That's much better than calibrating your monitor. I give people advice that's different depending on what sort of photography they do. So if you're a wedding photographer, for example, weekly is probably a good idea. You don't need to do it weekly, but if you do it weekly, it gets you in the habit of thinking about that color managed process you're working on. It starts you off at the beginning of your week, making sure your monitor's right, so those pictures you present to the couple are always the best you can do. If you're a fashion photographer, then I'd say do it daily because your customers are really fussy and they really want to see fastidiously accurate color and the whole process has to work that way. If you're like me and your background's in editorial, you know what, monthly's probably okay because the reproduction output that it's going to, being the web and newsprint and magazines, they're not as accurate on color. So you get away quite happily with weekly. And you can see, while I was chatting away there, it's finished. And it's telling us now how the device is done. So we asked for 100 candela. We got 100.1. I think that's good enough. Um, we didn't mention black level, but we, because it's hardware calibrated, it's got a black level here. And it's come back at 0.18. So we're doing quite well, even with this light sitting up here. Contrast ratio is 565 to 1. And the white point is actually 6511 as opposed to 6500. And that's probably a little bit to do with the illumination in the room. And then we are in here the Adobe, the Adobe color space there. And that's worked just fine. So let me click finish on that. And I'm going to kick the process off again uh, because I want you to see Now, this time, we've got a little device that's popped up from the base. And as I was saying, it doesn't matter that it's there. It could be there or there, anywhere on the screen. And that device is now going to do exactly the same job as this. And the difference between them, this is just more convenient, and you can run it on a schedule. That's the main difference. Whereas this one, you really need to be there when it's hanging over the device. Um, but if you're going to match two screens together, then you need the external device. Very important. And you can see now, we're getting the same color swatches coming up, and the same process runs through 
we get the same little illustration here showing you how the colors are being matched through. And I'm going to cancel that because you know that's working and you can see it and we don't need to uh, go through the whole process because we've just calibrated the monitor. Uh, bear with me a second while I just take the spider guy off the screen. And now let's just jump back to Lightroom here and back to good old Stan because this is all about your photographs. It's all about you getting the pictures you want to and being able to see those photographs in the way that you want other people to see them. And if I go down the, the bottom here, we're in the um, develop mode here in Lightroom. So now I've got Stan here in two modes. So Stan on the left, and I'm currently running in the Adobe color space with the white point at 6,500. Stan on the left here is how he was originally shot. Um, it was on a Hasselblad. No, I don't own one. I was just using one of Hasselblad's cameras. And uh, with a brom color light and a 100 mil lens, which is a very nice piece of glass. Here on the right hand side though, we don't have Stan the same as that one. We actually have him, and let me go and pick a... Uh, now we've picked traditional photo paper, and you can see there, probably not much different, allowing for the screens you're using there. If I go and pick something else, now let me go and... Uh, water-resistant canvas. And even on your screens, you're going to see that's gone flat. That's not how you'd want that pitch to look even on the canvas. You'd want to tweak around with that, just make it correct and maybe work with your curves uh, and get the balance correct with those. What this monitor is showing you is accurately, and this is called soft proofing, accurately what the original file was and what the print would look like. Of course, you need to have the white balance correct for the paper or the canvas that you're producing. And the canvas probably isn't 6,500, but this is still giving you a, a context here of how soft proofing works. So you can see exactly how it's going to come out. Now I'm going to let you into a little trick. I met a photographer who owns one of our screens, and he told me that he's been winning some competitions. And he went down to his club, and he measured the projector they're using. And he created a profile for the projector. And then he comes home and he edits his picture to match the projector it's going to be seen on by all his club members. So he's got a good photograph to win, but he's made it perfect by matching the output device with the picture he submits. Clever trick. And there's nothing more than actually matching it to the print device, getting the paper, the printer, and the inks correct. Or maybe you're going to put it up on a projector in a cinema, at which point you'd have another different white point and a different color space. So there's an introduction to what goes on with calibration. I think it's giving you an idea why you want to, to do it. And it's giving you an idea of the difference between a regular office-type monitor and a hardware calibrated monitor like the ISO monitor here. All you need to do now is go and shoot some great photographs. My name is Victor Aberdeen from ISO, and thank you to the Photographer's Academy for letting me present this to you. Thank you. <laughs>